Hello and welcome everyone to our second presentation on interpretation of CT scan of the lungs. Today's topic is how to approach a CT lung. Generally, the diagnosis of lung disease on a CT scan is based on three important elements. The first is recognition of the pattern of the disease. That is classifying the abnormalities into a category that is based on the appearance of the CT scan. Determination of the location and the distribution of the abnormalities in the lung and the distribution pattern. And lastly, but the most important part is a careful analysis of the patient data that is available at the time of the CT scan. This is the most important thing and this requires a proper coordination between the radiologist, the clinician and in some cases also the pathologist. Now, the CT interpretation as we said is dependent on the first is the appearance pattern, next is the distribution pattern, finally the patient data. You need for that a clinical input, pathological input and obviously the coordination from the radiology. Here, if we have previous CT scans, it is always better to compare it and give a proper diagnosis. Now coming first to the appearance pattern of the disease. Generally, CT findings can be classified into four large categories based on their appearances. The first is abnormality associated with an increase in lung opacity, that is increased lung attenuation. Abnormality is associated with decrease in lung opacity, that is decreased lung attenuation. Abnormalities present as nodular opacities. And finally, abnormalities present as linear opacities. Coming first to the increased lung attenuation. The normal lung density on CT scan is slightly higher than air and it's determined by mainly three components. The first is the lung tissue. The second is the blood in small vessels beyond the resolution of the CT scan and lastly air. Now lung opacity will increase if these following things happen. When the amount of lung tissue increases or this tissue becomes denser or larger in size. When the amount of blood in small vessels increase which is usually associated with the expansion of these vessels. When the relative amount of air decreases, which may be a result of the lung volume loss or replacement of the air in the airspace with fluids and or cells. Depending on the degree of the lung involvement, two types of increased lung opacity can be described. The first is the ground glass opacity or ground glass attenuation with mild involvement. This is something which can be physiological. Physiological ground glassing can be seen in dependent areas and at times in expiratory films also. The second is consolidation when the involvement is more advanced. The term ground glass opacity or ground glass attenuation is used to describe a hazy increase in lung opacity with the preservation of bronchial and vascular markings. While lung consolidation is always pathogenic and this term is used to describe an increase in pulmonary parenchymal attenuation that obscures the margins of the vessels and the airways. Here we can see that the involvement is mild. There is an increased attenuation which we can see all across but this is not associated with obscuring of the blood vessels and the airways. They are all clearly visible. So this is something which is called ground glassing. Now here you can see bronchial and vascular markings are clearly gone. In spite of the margins being invisible, the lumens of the bronchus may be visible. These are called air bronchograms. These are more pathognomic of consolidation. 
the decreased lung attenuation, an abnormal increase in the amount of air, an abnormal decrease in intravascular blood volume as a result of abnormal caliber of the vessels which are beyond the resolution of the CT and tissue destruction or tissue loss are responsible for decrease in lung attenuation. The main reasons for it are hypoperfusion, air trapping, cystic and cyst-like lesions, and lastly, pulmonary emphysema. Here we can see that there are areas which are normally perfused, while some areas are less perfused. This has resulted in uh, hypoattenuated lungs. These are seen especially in patient who had a recurrent episodes of pulmonary embolism. There is a difference in the caliber of the vessels in the areas which are not properly perfused. Here we can see large number of emphysematous changes in the lungs resulting in decreased attenuation. This is destruction of the lungs and increase in the air resulting in decreased attenuation. Next is nodular pattern. A nodular pattern is characterized by presence of multiple nodular opacities with a maximum diameter of 3 cm. A nodule with a diameter of less than 1 is defined as small nodule, whereas a nodule greater than 1 cm is often called as a large nodule. The CT assessment of the nodular pattern is based on the size, whether it is small or large, the appearance, whether it is well defined or ill defined. The attenuation that is a soft tissue or ground glass density distribution whether it is perilymphatic centrilobular or at random here we can see there are multiple nodular opacities in the especially in the upper lungs this is pneumoconiosis and here we can see the nodules are present but they are not as sharply demarcated here as they are over here they are diffusely demarcated so it is a more diffuse nodule this type of diffuse nodules are seen in mycoplasma pneumonia now coming to linear pattern the linear pattern is characterized by presence of multiple lines now since these lines very often cross one another they give a reticular pattern linear opacities can develop when the interstitium is thickened because of infiltration of cell fluids or other materials, when lymphatics are involved, when blood vessels increase in caliber and finally when the airway walls are thickened and or the lumens is filled with cells or other material. Here you can see the interstitial thickening is there which is a linear pattern. So there can be a combination of these four patterns and these may be pathognomotic of any particular disease. So here we can see there are areas of consolidation and ground glassing. Here we can see that there is a linear pattern, the reticular pattern with ground glassing. This is called crazy pavementing. Now localization and distribution of the disease. The distribution pattern is also important. So there are two steps to notice distribution. The first step is the overall distribution along the lungs. Whether the disease is predominantly located in the upper or in the lower lung or equally distributed. Whether the abnormality is predominantly located in the lung periphery or axially surrounding the large bronchovascular structures or perhaps somewhere in between. or whether the abnormality is, is preferably present more in the dependent areas or not. So once this is for the gross lung, once you have looked at the whole of the lung, the second step is to look at the secondary pulmonary nodule. The attempt should be made to further refine this localization by trying to relate the abnormality to the anatomy of the lung, especially the anatomy of the secondary pulmonary lobule, whether it is around the bronchovascular markings or it is around the interlobular septa or it is more in the parenchyma. This is the approach to a CT scan of the lungs. So in the next class, we will be discussing regarding the individual patterns of appearances. 
the increased attenuation decreased attenuation nodular and linear pattern all these patterns will be discussed separately thank you for your patience and check our website for further information